Hi everyone, I am very excited to share today's guest with you. His name is Bill McKibben. Bill McKibben is an author and environmentalist who in 2014 was awarded the Right Livelihood Prize, sometimes called the Alternative Nobel. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded as the first book for a general audience about climate change and has appeared in 24 languages. He's gone on to write a dozen more books. He is a founder of 350.org, the first planet-wide grassroots climate change movement, which has organized 20,000 rallies around the world in every country except for North Korea. He also spearheaded the resistance to the Keystone Pipeline and launched the fastest growing fossil fuel divestment movement. Foreign policy named him to their inaugural list of the world's 100 most important global thinkers, and the Boston Globe said he was probably America's most important environmentalist. A former staff writer for The New Yorker, he writes frequently for a variety of publications around the world, including the New York Review of Books, the National Geographic, and Rolling Stone. He lives in the mountains above Lake Champlain with his wife, Sue Hilpern, where he spends as much time as possible outdoors. Without further ado, let's welcome Bill McKibben. Bill McKibben, welcome to the Trapes and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Ming, what a pleasure to join you. So I am in Washington, D.C., and then my co-host, I will let him introduce himself and tell him where, where he is. Hi, Bill. Uh, this is Gene. I'm joining from Melbourne in Australia. And is that the Melbourne skyline behind you? It sure is. Uh, maybe in the afternoon. Right now, it's, uh, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. It's a little, a little bit different. Melbourne is one of my favorite cities, so I, it's a pleasure to get to talk with, some, with someone in Melbourne. Yeah, it's a lot of raining for, for my liking and gray, but <laughs> I'm sure Gene's happy to hear that he's a big fan of that city. So with that, we're going to kick off our first question. I want to know, so I know you graduated from Harvard University. That is mm -hmm. very impressive all on its own. So what made you be, be interested in writing about science and climate change content, even though perhaps you didn't have the most uh, scientific of backgrounds? So I was a journalist. My first job out of college, Ming, was at the New Yorker magazine, and I was a staff writer. I wrote a column called The Talk of the Town for the New Yorker. And um, while I was at the New Yorker, one of the pieces that I wrote was about where everything in my apartment in New York came from. And I traced all the lines back, you know, the Con Ed utility lines back to Brazil where they were buying oil and up into the Arctic where they were getting hydropower. And I went into the Grand Canyon to see where they were mining uranium. I followed the water lines up into upstate New York and went out with the trash barges that were dumping the city's garbage in the ocean and on and on and on. And I think what it helped me realize was what a physical place the world was. You know, I'm a good child of the suburbs. The suburbs are sort of designed to hide all the operations of the planet from you, you know? And because, because I had that sense that even Manhattan, which seems like such a place that can just create power and money and things on its own, was actually deeply physically dependent on the natural world, I think that set me up to be reading the science around climate change, the early science, in a different way than I might have. I had a much stronger sense that, that the arrangements that let the world work were kind of fragile and vulnerable. And I think really that's what led me when I was 27 or 28 to be writing The End of Nature, which was the first book about climate change. And it actually was excerpted in The New Yorker as it came out. Mm -hmm. That's great. Wonderful. Um, so the next question is, how does your faith influence your uh, approach to combating climate change? Because I know you're a Methodist um, Sunday teacher or something like that. I do teach Sunday school, or at least I have in the past um, um, on occasion. Um, and I am a Methodist. Um, so for, I think for uh, Christians, 
uh, the environment is an interesting issue. When you read the Old Testament of the Bible, the very first thing that people are asked to do is take care of this world that God has created for us. And if you read the New Testament, the Gospels, the main thing Jesus tells us to do is love our neighbors. But of course, at the moment, we're not taking care of the planet very well. We're running its temperature up and, you know, driving most of the other species to extinction and on and on. And we're certainly not being very good to our neighbors. We're drowning them. We're making them sick. It's making it impossible for them to, you know, raise food, all, all the things that human beings need. We're making more difficult um, <clears throat> just by the ways that we're conducting our lives in the richest parts of the world. So I do think for people of faith, for many traditions, from the Christian tradition, the Muslim tradition, the Jewish, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Sikh, the Jain, all these traditions um, uh, come together with the deep scientific tradition, you know, which is uh, just another way of kind of understanding how the world works and what it means. And, and I think now it's a good thing that all these traditions are pointing us in the same way. I've been most impressed to watch the way that indigenous traditions have really emerged at the kind of forefront of the environmental fight. And I think that's important because they're the very oldest wisdom traditions on the planet. You know, Gene, in your country, they stretch back 40,000 years, you know. It's very powerful that those very ancient wisdom traditions are lining up with the very newest, that the visions that are coming from the sweat lodge and the visions that are coming from the supercomputer and the satellite are meshing. And they're really saying the same thing. We need to learn to live a little more simply than we're living now. That, that is right. Um, and there was something in the news, which I won't go into today, but yeah, 40,000 40, years or more uh, is, is how long the records go back in Australia. And, and there was a terrible story last week from the papers about how oil and gas explore had, you know, companies said, destroyed a 30,000 year old archaeological site, you know, a, a site, sacred site to Aboriginal people in Australia. Just a reminder of all the kinds of damage that are getting done now. Um, so next, I wanted to move on to 350.org, which has, you know, been a big part of your life that you, you founded. Um, so it's a very successful worldwide climate change movement. So what can, my question regarding that is, what can uh, the youth contribute to the climate change fight that older people are unable to contribute and vice versa. So go through the pros and cons of both groups. That is a good question. And Ming, it's really close to my heart. You know, I started 350.org with seven college students. I was uh, in my, I was about 50, but they were all young. And, and so from the beginning, I've worked with young people. And one of the best things that's happened in recent years is just this explosion of energy from young people in these fights. You've seen Greta Thunberg, the wonderful Swedish high school student who started these climate strikes. And she's really is great. I've gotten to know her and I really like her and admire her. But the best news is there are thousands of Greta Thunbergs all around the world. Young people, high school and junior high school age, even younger, who are eloquent, articulate, powerful leaders who are really making change. They were managed to get 8 million people in the streets around the world last autumn in these climate big biggest climate strike day. And it was really powerful and really important. Sometimes the only thing that worries me is that the rest of the world is going to look at this and think, let's take the biggest problem we've ever faced and offload it onto the shoulders of you know high school sophomores. Um, which would not be fair or smart. Grown-ups have to play a big role here too. They have a couple of things that young people don't have. One is the right to vote. In my country this year, it's never been more important that we have the right to vote because we got to get rid of the guy who's running things now. And grown-ups have money. Um, and money is really the fuel on which the fires of global warming burn, you know? So, um... So you're right, older people have, you know, the, the financial resources and perhaps some, some more time to an extent as well. Um, and uh, so I, I want to follow up on that with the different groups that you've been able to mobilize at the grassroots level, whether it's young people or old people or people of color. Um, you know, 
you have written letters asking people to get arrested. Um, however, um, as you know, and, and I know you've touched upon this in um, a couple of your interviews, uh, you know, it's it's hard to ask people to get arrested, especially, you know, minority mm -hmm. groups, um, black minority men, for one instance, um, because, you know, the stigma is huge to go, um, go to jail um, for these climate strikes. And for young people in general, because we don't have the financial resources, and it really affects our job prospects and yes. employment. And so when we have that, you know, record, um, so basically, what what solutions? Why call for this kind of action when you yeah. know these effects, negative effects? So sometimes civil disobedience is really important. I mean, the 20th century, great leaders like Gandhi, Dr. King, the suffragettes, others, taught us that sometimes this is one of the important tools in the activist toolkit. Not by any means the only one or even the most important. You shouldn't use it all the time because like any tool that gets dull from overuse, but there are moments. Now I did, I wrote the first, the beginning of the fight against what was called the Keystone Pipeline. That was sort of the first big civil disobedience action of the climate movement. I did write the letter asking people to come to Washington and get arrested. But one of the things I said in that letter was, I didn't think that young people who were otherwise providing so much of the leadership for the movement should have to be the ones who took this step. Because as you point out correctly, if you're 22, you know, an arrest record may not be the best thing for your resume. Past, I mean, you know, growing old has a uh, few blessings maybe, but one of them is past a certain point, what the hell are they gonna do to you, you know? Um, so it was really good to see a lot of people with hairlines like mine arriving in Washington to get arrested. It was good for young people to see their elders acting the way we actually sort of need elders acting in a working society. Now, your other point about uh, people of color is very true. And this is one of these places where, you know, if people have what we call now white privilege, then they might as well make some use of it, you know. Um, and it is much, much easier in an unfair and unjust system uh, uh, for white people to go off and deal with police and things. That said, of course, you know, we learned how to do this mostly from people living on the margins of society. That's what, you know, Dr. King and the civil rights movement was. Mm -hmm. So um, where is that boundary to, where is that maximum boundary for minority groups or young people who don't want to get arrested? Well, it all have... depends. It, it, I mean, it's very much place by place and situation by situation. And many of the people who are doing, you know, some of the best work, uh, and, and including in civil disobedience, are people of color and, and, and others. I mean, I, you know, I wrote an op-ed in the um, New York Times with my great friend and colleague, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, who runs the Hip Hop Caucus, about the two of us getting arrested in January in the lobby of the Chase Bank branch nearest the Capitol, because Chase Bank is the biggest funder of fossil fuels in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so speaking of minority groups, um, I want to cover one of the larger minority groups in the world, which you may know, um, which accounts for 1 billion people in the world, 20% um, people with disabilities. So as the slogan goes, <laughs> which I heard it from you first, actually, to change everything, we need everyone. I know you didn't come up with it, but how can we make your rallies and protests more accessible and inclusive to everyone, regardless of abilities and disabilities? I see that sometimes you have sign language interpreters at your, you know, some of your speaking engagements. What else uh, do you do to ensure people with disabilities are included in the climate change fight conversations? Well, it's really important. And I mean, I, I, first of all, a very good thing about say the lessons we're learning during this pandemic year uh, is that you know we can do a ton of work the way that we're doing things right now you know, and in ways that put everybody on an absolutely equal footing, you know. Um, um, so that's really good and a good thing to be reminded of. But yeah, there's time, I mean, uh, when things are going on in the street, you have to uh, think as much as you can about that. That's why, you know, 
that's why it's been, I mean, one of, at least in the States, uh, you know, the great work of disability rights advocates over the last couple of decades means that most of our urban streets are now accessible enough that people can take full part in rallies and marches and things like that. Um, uh, it's obviously makes it, I mean, there's plenty of conditions that make it difficult to do things like go to jail. There's no need, you know, that's not, that's not like required work. Climate change really is the example of the thing that's going to require everybody to work on it. It's the first truly global crisis that we ever faced in that its causes and effects are absolutely everywhere. And there's just no way to deal with it without having everybody engaged. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how my follow up question is very much related. How can people with certain disabilities who cannot go out and protest very easily in large crowds help and <laughs> support combat climate change. Give me some specific examples, sure. some specific sure. uh, actions that they can take. So most of the work that gets done at a group like 350.org or the Sierra Club or whatever, most of it's done on Facebook. It's done on Twitter. It's done by making phone calls. It's done by writing letters to politicians. It's done by raising money for political campaigns. Those are all the things that, you know, that constitutes 90% of the work. The, the, the stuff that you see out in the street or something might just be the, like the tip of the iceberg. And by itself, it wouldn't mean anything. All that's doing is providing, that's like um, charging up the battery with enough energy that then you can go spend doing all those other tasks. You know, so that if you get a bunch of people out in the street, then politicians see, oh yeah, there's this is real. There's something behind here. We better listen to it. But then you have to go talk to them. You have to, and that we can do now in a thousand ways. And people, you know, some of the most effective advocates in the world never leave their room because they can't leave their room. But that means that, what do you know, they're able to work uh, uh, with great discipline and, and and a lot of hours. That's one of the great things about a digital age. Uh, this kind of fighting is way more accessible than it used to be. Yeah, and the COVID-19 pandemic is showing how much you can really do from home, right? Because you, I'm sure you're doing uh, climate change activism work at home. Absolutely. As... One of the things that happens is you use a lot less carbon. Uh, CO2 emissions fell 10 or 15%. Now they're going right back up as people go back to work. And what did people learn? I mean, people learned that you don't have to get on airplanes as much as we thought you did, you know? We've all figured out, like, Zoom, you know, I mean, it's not the same as being there in person, but it's in certain ways much better, you know? Like, you don't have to get on an airplane and disrupt your life completely. And you don't, you know, I mean, th there, there's a lot to be said for the lessons that we're learning right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So according to UN estimates, which you've said multiple times, um, we will likely have 1 billion climate change re refugees on the planet. And no doubt some of these people, I gather, will be people with disabilities. Uh, what can we do right now to prepare for this many refugees and a lot of them being people with disabilities and having these resources and facilities be accessible to all? So first thing is, the, the single most important job is to try and limit the amount the temperature rises. And we're talking hundreds of millions of people. So job one is to limit it and as much as we possibly can. And then job two is, I'm afraid it's a very hard job, is to start planning for how you deal with refugees at all. I mean, yes, people who have disabilities are going to be even harder to leave home and, and go someplace else. But sadly, it's not easy for anybody in this world because A, it's hard to pick up and leave home. What are you gonna do? I mean, that's everything that you've ever known you're leaving behind. But B, it's not like there's many places to go. I mean, I think a lot about Bangladesh, which is a country where I've spent a lot of time. I completely love, it's incredibly beautiful. But it's also, you know, low to the Bay of Bengal. It's a river delta. There's already millions of people who've had to leave their homes and move to the capital city, and they're gonna to have to leave large parts of Bangladesh over this century. But where are they gonna go? They're right next to India. It's not like there's huge amounts of land in India for people to go to. You know, you and I are in the United States, you see what happens 
when immigrants, refugees show up on our southern border, you know, in Jean's country, they don't even let people get near the shore. They intercept them at sea and take them out to grim, like prison islands where they're supposed to spend the rest of their lives. So one of the things we're going to have to do is have a serious conversation as a world about what solidarity looks like. Um, you know, most of the people who are going to have to be refugees did very little to cause the problem that they're now suffering from. They weren't the ones burning huge quantities of fossil fuel. And so there's a moral question and a practical one. There aren't enough walls and cages and prison islands and things to deal with the flood of people that'll be coming if we warm up the planet the way we're doing at the moment. This century is going to be a lot about survival, and that requires solidarity. Either that or it requires people in rich countries trying to like build themselves into fortresses, which is the ugliest and unhappiest idea I can imagine. Or, or fly, fly to outer space, right? Have Elon Musk, I'll take us there. Yeah, well, it's probably a bad sign that the like, you know, richest guys in the planet, the one thing that they all have in common is they want to leave, you know. Um, so, I mean, I mean, there's days when I think that might not be the worst thing in the world uh, uh, if some of them, you know, ended up on Mars, but they're not taking many of us with them. You know, we're going to have to solve our problems here on Earth. Yeah. Well, with that grim uh, end to my section, I'm going to have Jean, uh, Jean make it more positive. Save the planet, Jean. Sure. Um, yeah, actually, maybe that's a, a good segue because uh, one of the most beautiful things uh, on the planet is our barrier reef in mm. Queensland, yes. um, which I always refer to. And um, some of the, the best memories I have, are, you know, just simply snorkeling straight over, you know, parts of the reef and seeing all the diversity of the animals, um, of you know, the fish and, and different species, and even just the coral. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I did that as a kid. Um, and then I've gone back uh, a couple of times and, you know, the, the change is pretty evident. You see, um, it, it's, it's right there and it's disappearing. It's, um, you know, part of, part of that will be my doing. Oh, it's very hard, Gene. The, you know, the Great Barrier Reef is the biggest living structure on planet Earth, but it's only about half as living as it was five years ago. I was there two or three years ago. I was in Australia to help fight that big Adani coal mine. Um, and, but I had a couple of days and went to uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And in fact, the captain who took the boat out had taken David Attenborough out a few years before for that scene in Blue Planet where they watched the coral spawn, one of the most beautiful, you know, just unbelievable fertility, you know, just incredible. Well, we went to exactly the same place, same GPS coordinates, dropped anchor at the same spot, dove down, and it was like diving into a parking garage. There was nothing left. I mean, just dead gray coral stretching as far as the eye could see. Uh, so depressing. Such a metaphor for where we are. We think that even with even if we were able to hold temperature rise to two degrees Celsius, which at this point would be a small miracle, the coral reef researchers think that that would kill off about 99% of the coral reefs on the planet. So this may be a system that we're losing, a kind of corner of God's brain that we're lobotomizing. And it should be a huge reminder to us uh, not to let any more damage happen than we have to. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that was very sobering. Um, so I, I, I guess I'd follow up that question with, um, are there any things that uh, may be easier to do to protect our oceans um, that aren't directly related to all the other things that we're doing? So well, so there are things that, that would certainly help. Things like, I mean, there's a huge problem with plastic in the ocean, and we don't need to use single-use plastics as much as we do, uh, uh, certainly in able-bodied communities and things. Um, but the biggest problems that the ocean faces, frankly, are the rapid heating and the rapid acidification, and both of those are tied to combustion of fossil fuels. So there's really almost any problem you look at right now, environmental problem you look at around the world right now, at some level, one of the root causes is burning coal and gas and oil. And we just have to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, that would be, we, you know, you could say that, but what would you replace them with? 
now we know. Now we know that sun and wind are cheap enough to allow that to happen. And Australia is a great example. I mean, you look there at South Australia, and it's producing huge amounts of renewable energy. Elon Musk went and put the biggest battery in the world in South Australia, and it's been working great and saving tons of money for ratepayers and things. So uh, Australia, like many other places around the world, is an example that we could do things. But it's also, as you know, an example of just how powerful the coal lobby is that keeps us from doing things. Yeah, um, we we're going to mention that, uh, you know, renewables sometimes come for free, like, you know, the, the wind and the, you know, uh, that's, the why, sun. that's why Exxon right. hates. That's what, you know, if you're Exxon, you've made your business model by having people write a check for you every month for their whole lives to get some more oil. What do you I mean? The sun comes up in the morning and delivers your power for free. That's the stupidest business model in the whole world. You know, no wonder you spend all your time fighting it. Yeah, um, and it, it's strange that uh, the people buying it, like myself, to power my you know, apartment and my devices, um, it, why is there such a disconnect? Like if, if we know it's coming in for free and we know that we're paying a large amount of money to dig stuff out of the ground for power or, you know, like why, why is there still such a disconnect? At, well, that's just, know? and that's what the, this disinformation campaign for 30 years that the fossil fuel industry has run so powerfully has been about. I mean, in Australia, you know, they had a whole campaign on the TV all the time about, you know, uh, I forget what it was like, beautiful, magical coal, you know, and they'd be like dancing lumps of coal and, you know, whatever. It's like, you know, come on. Yeah. Um, um, but that stuff works, you know, that's how you buy political power. So our job is to build movements to challenge that. And I mean, there's no other, there's no shortcut to it, you know. Um, um, you have to build those movements. Uh, that's definitely right. And on, on the subject of money, um, we, we keep seeing government stimuluses uh, being announced all around the world for COVID-19. And like the, the numbers are just staggering. And uh, I was, it just makes me think like if, if we spent that amount of money to address other things such as uh, global warming and climate change, uh, would, would the amount of money do you think at the moment being spent to fix one solution be enough to solve things that you're working towards? Yes, it would be a big down payment on it anyway. And that's why smart countries are using the COVID recovery to enact various versions of a Green New Deal. So if you look at South Korea, or you look at Germany, or you look at a few other countries, that's precisely what they have in mind. They're like, yeah, we have to put people back to work. So how are we gonna do it? Well. We have this huge need. We got to put a lot of insulation in homes, and put up a lot of solar panels and build a lot of EV charging stations. So let's have these people do that. You know, it gives them a good useful job that helps us solve the next crisis that's coming. Instead of, you know, just like, let's get back to normal, which is kind of just like setting up the pins at the end of the bowling alley again, just waiting for the next strike that you know is coming, you know. Yeah. But, that's what, again, that's why movements are so important. And, and Ming, of course, this is a place where, you know, disability rights advocates have an enormous amount to teach us. I mean, one of the most powerful things I've seen this year, you may have seen it, this documentary, Crip Camp, that came out earlier this year. If you, people haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix, I think now. And, and, it really, I mean, it's really a reminder that these were some of the greatest organizers that the world's ever seen. I mean, they really knew how to get the message across. And there's a lot of things they have to teach environmental advocates. I'll put that one on the list to have a, have a watch of. Absolutely. So if I may, I actually wanted to follow up on one of the questions you two are talking about regarding solar and wind power, which, you know, we, as we said, are free. So it doesn't make sense to me. Why aren't people taking advantage of it m more? Um, well, is, is it purely uh, because of how it's marketed to the broader public by corporate oil companies, as you were alluding to, um, Bill? Or is there a deeper un underpinning with the inefficiency and the ultimate, you know, ultimately relying on fossil fuels to function well? Right. It's a good question. So it's not free. I mean, you have to put a solar panel on your roof, okay? And that costs money. And so it's an upfront cost. 
And then once you've paid that, then the power comes for free. So the question is, how do you allow people to pay that upfront cost? Can you figure out ways? So in, a, in, a, in, a, in places that are doing this smartly, they provide uh, financing or a subsidy of some kind to get that up on the roof uh, uh, or to build big solar power stations in the desert or, or whatever it is because they know that that upfront money is way worth paying, not only because the power eventually is cheaper, but also because if you don't put that carbon into the atmosphere, you avoid the incredibly expensive costs of dealing with climate change. Think how much it's gonna cost to protect any of our coastal cities from the rising oceans. Think how much it's gonna cost to deal with those billion refugees. Um, um, you know, if you start doing that kind of math, then, you'd be spending every penny that your government has on solar power as fast as you could. Yeah, that's the difference between thinking individually and collectively, right? Rather, it's the collective's problem, but the, it's the individual's cost. That's um, it. Nice so that's, that's, that's the issue. So also, what are your thoughts on, um, I think combating climate change is clearly very complicated. I think renewable resources is definitely a route that that is an option, um, part of the solution. Um, but what, what, what are your thoughts on population, implementing population control policies um, to combat, combat climate change as well? I don't think we should have population control policies. I don't really think governments are in the, should be in the position of telling you how many kids to have. And I don't think we need to because we've learned a lot about how to drive down the rate of population increase. You know, 30 or 35 years ago, the average woman on this planet had about six children. And that number is now about 2.3. So that's been an extraordinary change. And it didn't come about mostly because, and that, I mean, that math doesn't include China, which did have a mandatory one child policy. Um, in other places, the thing that's managed to bring down birth rates so powerfully isn't legislation, it's educating and empowering women. To the degree that women are empowered, it turns out that most of them don't want to have six kids, you know, and and so that's been the greatest, I don't know, contraceptive or whatever that there ever was, and so I, and at the moment it's not population growth that's driving climate change. Most population growth now is coming in very poor parts of the world. I mean, we think that the Earth's population, which is nearing 8 billion now, is going to top out someplace around 10 billion in the middle of the century. And, you know, that'll be, that extra 2 billion will be hard, but almost all of it's in very poor places. And we forget how big the difference is in the use of resources. So the average American family <clears throat> or Australian family, since they're about comparable, uses more energy between the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve and dinner on January 2nd than the average Tanzanian family uses in a year. So do the math, you know, um, that's Tanzanians are not who's driving climate change. Mm -hmm. So you're saying there isn't the need to implement uh, population control policies if the growth is in developing countries. But what if that growth was in uh, the first world in, in, in the global north? Well, I don't think that there's a need to implement policies, but I do think it's smart for people to think about how many kids they should have. I wrote a book called Maybe One, An Argument for Smaller Families, and it was interesting. Um, it turns out, and one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I have one child, and we at the time we wanted to know if that was okay. Um, it turns out that the biggest single reason that people have more than one child is because they're afraid that an only child will be spoiled or a bad, you know, just like not warped in some way. And it turns out that's not something you should worry about. Only children do fun. When people grow up, there's no way to tell. There's no statistic you can look at about happiness or success or anything else that lets you guess whether they were an only child or had a sibling. So if the biggest reason that people are doing this is a bad reason, then all we need to do is just kind of talk about it, you know. Uh, and population growth rates are not high in the global north. They're, they're quite low in most places. Yeah, 
your daughter's Sophie being case in point, right? My brother went to Brown as well. I saw that she's at Brown. Or there was you are. At Brown. There you are. <laughs> um, yes, terrific. And uh, the next question I have is on fossil fuel. So I know you believe that it should be illegal at some point. I don't know if you still think so, but say if it was illegal, what's the next best alternative? Because like it or not, fossil fuels are very reliable. Right. So uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know about illegal, but we should replace them with sun and wind and batteries. And batteries are really important. That's why the rapid fall in the price of batteries and people like Elon Musk's development of them is so crucial. Because if you have a battery, then a solar panel is just as reliable as an oil fired power plant or engine or something, right? Because when the sun's out, you're making plenty of power and you're storing it in a battery. And when the sun goes down, you use the battery. Uh, you know, we set, you set up a lot of wind turbines and solar panels in the same places. Some days it'll be sunny, some days it'll be cloudy and windy. You've got an energy you need. Um, that's where the world's going to go. The question, Ming, is how quickly we're going to go there. Climate change is the first problem we face that really has a time limit. And if we don't solve it very soon, we won't solve it because we'll go past these tipping points. Uh, Antarctic ice melt, things like that, that just will give it a kind of endless vicious cycle. Uh, so 75 years from now, the world's definitely going to run on sun and wind because of its economics. But if it takes 75 years to get there, the world that runs on sun and wind will be a broken world. We have to go very fast. That's, what, that's why we need movements forcing governments to act quickly. Yeah, I saw your piece in the time about 2050, right? What the world looks like. Yes. Um, we, right. the, there's a lot of talk just at the moment with um, hydrogen. And that's not a familiar topic to most people, but it is touted as one of the alternative energies or, or energy um, storage mechanisms as well. Um, do you have yes, any thoughts on that? That could help. Um, people who it's not a it. thing I know a huge amount about, but Australia is actually an interesting place to be thinking about this. Because Australia, for instance, has the capacity to produce far more renewable energy than it needs, right? There's not that many people in Australia, and there's a huge deserts and things where you can produce virtually unlimited amounts of clean energy. Mm -hmm. So then think about a country like mm, Japan or South Korea, where land is very scarce, and it's not possible to produce, or it's difficult to produce from sun and wind as much energy as they use. So one possibility is to take a place like the desert in Australia and use it to produce clean energy to produce a, 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 a transportable fuel like hydrogen, ammonia, and take it to uh, Japan or South Korea and run industry off that there. And those are things that people are looking at and exploring. So that's a very real possibility. Fantastic, thank you. What to look into there for me. Great, uh, so next I wanted to, Bill, I'm gonna cover a topic perhaps you won't be the happiest about, I hope. Uh, uh, and that is Michael Moore's movie, which you know uh, nearly 8.5 million people have watched it. Um, and my question to you is, um, you know, and one of the, the articles this is what you wrote. The, the film is attacking renewable energy as a sham and arguing that the environment, environmental movement is just a tool of corporations trying to make money off green energy. So what do you think Moore's intention is for doing this? And are you willing to admit that even if we convert to 100% re renewable energy, uh, climate change will still be a problem due to overpopulation of human population in the last 200 years, as the film alludes. So I, I don't have any idea why he, you know, why he did it. You'll have to, you'll have to get him on your program and find out. Um, but as now dozens, probably hundreds of articles have explained, the science is simply wrong in the in the movie. I mean, they claim that there's no difference between using renewable energy and using fossil fuel, and that's, you know, just completely scientifically wrong. Um, does changing to renewable energy solve all our problems? No, uh, not even close. But 
the job of people at the moment is to move as fast as we can in the right direction. And one of the biggest steps we can take in the right direction is to rapidly build out renewable energy, clean energy. And uh, I, you know, the good news is I think we're starting to do it around the world. The question, as I said, is how quickly we'll be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where does, um, so as, I, I'm not sure if you saw the film or not, um, but one of the, during, during the beginning, they were talking about these charging stations for electric cars, right? Um, how, how the energy ultimately comes from coal or natural gas. Um, so what do, you, what do you have to say to that? Well, that's why we need to replace coal and natural gas with sun and wind. You know, I mean, that seems as obvious as it's possible to be. It's just the thing we've been talking about. So the, the charging stations for the electric cars, that energy ultimately comes from there as well? Yes, you know, I have an electric car and the power for it comes off my roof, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's why renewable energy is so crucial. And you think and that's- the electric cars is, that it has the potential to make use of renewable energy. So you can't run a gasoline powered car off renewable energy, right? You can't, I mean, it requires gasoline. If you have an electric car, it's true that the electricity might come from coal, but that's why we're fighting so hard to cut, shut down coal fired power plants. And potentially you can run it on clean energy like mine, for instance. And that's easily sca scalable. So you can do that at a mass <laughs> scale. Nothing's easy. If I, if you've come away with the impression that any of this is easy to do, then then you're wrong. I, I've misled you. It's the hardest thing we've ever done. That's why you know we end up having to go to jail all the time, and why we've worked for so many years. If it was easy, we would have gotten it done. But we're up against the richest industry in the world, so that's hard. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on cutting down trees or using animal fat for biomass? You know, I'm sure you know of alligator fat and seaweed as some of the examples. Yeah, seaweed I don't know about, I, I don't know much about. Cutting down trees is a very bad idea and I can forward you these articles I've been writing about this for years and years. The reason is, I mean, it would stand, to, I mean, logically you'd say, well, it's not as bad as fossil fuel because, you, because when you cut down a tree and burn it, to make electricity, another tree will grow in its place and it will soak up that carbon, right? So that's why people are like, okay, we, this might be better. But it turns out that it really isn't, mostly because of the timing. And we don't need it anymore because sun and wind are so cheap. That's why I keep talking about them. That's the direction we need to be going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Bill. That was all of our questions. And I would like to mention as a fun fact that we are all December babies here. December 10th, Jean's December 6th, and you're December 8th. There you are. We're, we line up right in a row. <laughs> and all uh, right. yeah, thank you so much. Maybe, and we've Jean, learned a lot. This was a great pleasure for me, both of you. And um, many thanks for having me. And, and we'll look forward to working together in the future. Take care, y'all. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives, keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Traipsing Global on Wheels podcast hour.